Dozens of current and former employees of the New York City Housing Authority were arrested earlier this month. They've been slapped with federal charges of bribery and extortion for taking kickbacks from companies getting housing development contracts. The Housing and Urban Development's Office of Inspector General helped conduct the multi-agency investigation leading to those charges. IG Ray Oliver Davis joins me now with details. Ms. Davis, good to have you back. Oh, thank you so much, Tom. I really appreciate your interest in this case. And what was the nature of the case? It sounds like pretty old-fashioned bribery. We'll give you a contract, we get a kickback, and la-di-da. Exactly. It's it's uh, what you hear law enforcement call a pay-to-play scheme. And what we learned w- was that superintendents throughout NYCHA were taking bribes in order to award contracts. These were what we call micro-purchase uh, micro, micro purchase contracts, meaning they were they were small repairs, uh, five to ten thousand dollars. So the superintendents had autonomy to award those contracts rather than compete them. But often they were asking for two, three, three thousand dollar bribes on the front end to award the contract. Sometimes people were having to pay bribes to keep the contract or even get the work signed off on the back end. So good old fashioned pay to play bribery. Although three thousand dollar kickback on something in the five to ten thousand dollar range doesn't seem like a real good deal for the uh, contractors, it's a wonder they agreed to it. You know, it's work, right? It um, it, it gets you through the door, and it and it gets you work, certainly. Or it shows how much profit there is in it if you can still get away with whole and having paid a third of the thing away in bribes. Exactly. You know, we we think with the current charges, we're looking at about. $2 million in bribes collectively, I believe. Yeah, so enough to make a difference in the bribe taker's life, really. If there's even 70 of them, you know, it's still a pretty good sum there. And Absolutely. how did it come to light? Was it a whistleblower or what? You know, it's an ongoing investigation, so I want I want to be cautious about talking about how these charges came to light. Um, there certainly were allegations that, that that came forward, and we teamed up with the New York Department of Investigations, Homeland Security Investigations, DOL, OIG was involved. Um, luckily, we had the attention of the Southern District of New York, um, and and we went after went after these these individuals and investigated them, and it resulted in the arrest of seventy individuals um, collectively. Early morning, uh, seven hundred agents came in from all over the country to conduct these arrests. So it was really a quite large operation. And it sounds like a multi location operation because. The way you describe the New York City Housing Authority, there's not one place where it all happens. No, that's right. And in fact, I was I went up that morning to be with my agents at headquarters and to monitor the teams as they were out in the field conducting the arrest. You know, some of these arrests took, took place at six o'clock in the morning at homes. Others were on site when people arrived for work and others were, frankly, at airports. Some people were in transit. Uh, so it was um, a very large law enforcement effort that and- resulted in these arrests. How high up the chain of command did the briberies go? Was it directors of local offices or was it pretty much those down on the day-to-day contracting and management area keeping the housing repaired? Well, you know, that's a good question. And and currently the charges are against 70 former and current superintendents. I say current. They're obviously not current now, but they were current at the time. Um, and the matter's ongoing and additional charges might be brought. That will be dependent upon our partners at DOJ. My HUD, OI, HUD OIG agents will certainly continue to support the investigation, and they'll follow the facts where they take them. And a couple of background questions. Is New York City Housing Authority the biggest one that HUD deals with? It is. It's the largest housing authority. Um, It services about one in 17 New Yorkers. There are collectively about 500,000 New Yorkers that live there. So this had a huge impact on New York. And, you know, Tom, you ask about you know, the the amount of the bribery, and we talked about the amount of the, the contracts. For me, this was really about the public trust, right? Uh, protecting trust in these programs as much as the money, certainly. Um, you know, I think this certainly had an impact on New York, but something of this scale will draw a reputational risk um, and a trust risk from the American taxpayers and beneficiaries throughout the country. We're speaking with Ray Oliver Davis, Inspector General at Housing and Urban Development. And just a basic question, why was this a federal matter? I'm presuming that most of the money originated with HUD as grants uh, to the New York City Housing Authority. Well, for us, um, certainly we, we go where the HUD money takes us, and HUD spends about $2 billion a year 
at NYCHA. So that was that's easily, uh, when we look in terms of high risk uh, to the programs, that's easily a place that we were going. And frankly, you know, as I announced an audit while we were up there at the day of the takedown, and we were already looking at NYCHA for this audit when the takedown started to come to fruition. But we backed off a bit because it was a covert operation to let that go forward. And now we're pushing forward with our audit. I was up uh, in New York yesterday for the entrance conference. So we'll be we'll be heading out with that. And the audit will cover what what? What was it you were planning to audit in the first place? So, again, looking across the HUD portfolio, portfolio at risk and NYCHA being the largest public housing authority and a tremendous amount of money going there, um, we're looking to you know spend our resources in the riskiest parts. So we're looking at fraud risk management. And this is something that we've looked at department-wide at the very top within HUD. We're looking at um, is HUD specifically – assessing the risk in their programs and are they mitigating that risk and are they continuing on in order to form an anti, like an anti-fraud culture at the department we found that that hud at the department level is really just starting out they haven't conducted risk assessments within their own programs um, consistently we've heard from the department either we don't see fraud in our programs or we think that that is a job for our grantees well, then that causes us to look at NYCHA because it is such a large program participant. So we're headed um, to look at them in terms of their own fraud risk management. It's basically the same thing. Are they assessing their risk? Are they continuing to get better with time? And are we ultimately, I think, producing this, what I'm going to call an ecosystem around the funding, where we have internal controls that are exceptionally strong, promoting anti-fraud culture, and we as law enforcement continue doing what we're doing to get the bad actors out of the program. And we just provide as much protection sure. for the money and, and the tenants as we can. You have a similar problem or analogous problem, let's say, to the Labor Department, which disperses money to state-operated unemployment fund systems where there's a lot of fraud and abuse and so forth. So it's kind of a recurring theme, federal money, state or local, municipally carried out programs, but ultimately there's still federal taxpayer dollars. Absolutely. Um and we've made this fraud risk management a priority recommendation for the department. So we'll see what what what, what comes of this. Uh, the CEO was present yesterday at NYCHA and all of her top executives, and we had a very good dialogue. And we're going to go in and learn what they're already doing and then see if we can make recommendations for improvements. Presuming she keeps her job, who knows where this could go, but I won't ask you to speculate on that one. But what about the big contracts? I mean, you're talking small potatoes, just a lot of little bribes over a period of time for, you know, I don't know, replacing bathrooms or whatever they do for five or ten thousand dollars. And that must happen tens of thousands of times throughout the vast NYCHA system. But what about, say, contracts to build a new building or a major renovation that might be a multi million dollar operation? You really gotta watch that one where it might have slightly different and more subtle bribery mechanisms. Those are good questions. And I'm hoping that this audit work will reveal um, some of the controls that are in place there or the lack of controls. You know, at the meeting yesterday, the CEO had her uh, chief compliance officer present, and that's something that is new for NYCHA and comes on the heels of the monitor, um, the monitor being in place back in 2019. So we'll be asking those questions. We'll be learning what they're doing for the larger contracts as well. And it strikes me, getting back to the specific case, that if they're taking two, three thousand dollar bribes and five and ten thousand dollar contracts, there's a lot of maintenance potentially that just doesn't get done because the money is siphoned off. Well, that's a good question too. Now, my understanding with the current charges is that we don't necessarily have allegations that in these particular instances that repairs weren't being made. Certainly, living conditions are the utmost important to us, and I'm sure that we'll be asking those questions along the way. Absolutely. Because you see these driving into New York, you know, you see these gigantic projects, 30-story buildings and 10 of them in a row. You really wonder what goes on inside of a vast complex like that. And, Tom, really, when we're talking about these micro-purchases, the reason the superintendents were given autonomy on the front end is so they could move quickly, so they could help improve conditions. That was the the policy and the theory around giving them their own um, – authority to award the contracts. But as we can see, people took advantage of that. So we'll be looking at that. Yeah, it's almost the equivalent of micro card purchases at the or credit card micro purchases at the federal level. You really need the diffusion of that authority because you can't have centralized management of every little tiny thing or it would come to a halt at the other extreme. Absolutely. You have to have a risk tolerance and you have to be on the lookout for bad actors at all times. Right. So if there's a 
poor culture of risk management and anti-fraud controls at that level, it's a good guess it could creep up to higher levels. And then next thing you know, you're talking real money. We'll see. Like I said, we ultimately want to have um, protection of 